welcome everybody to Reader's Books. Um, and thank you so much for, for adjusting to what we need to do for, for everything. Um, my name's Rosie, I'm the events coordinator here. So one of the things that I've always really liked about working at Reader's is that I get to learn a lot of different things. Um, too often it's either, oh, you can save the world or we're all going to die. And this book is a really, really excellent midway point between things are hard, things are bad, people are doing good stuff. And, and that's, that's what we, we need in the world. That Adina Marylander, who's here to talk about the book Climate Stewardship, is an internationally recognized conservation biologist. Um, she's currently a cooperative extension specialist at UC Berkeley. And her research specializes in climate stewardship, that's, that's the book, um, climate-wise habitat connecting, um, working lands, conservation, um, and community science. Um, and that, in many ways, is what this book is about, furthering what you know about where you're from, how to protect it, and how to adapt to things that are changing. Um, and obviously, Adina knows a lot more about this than I do. So if you could give her a really big round of applause. Thank you. Oh, so nice to be in person. My first in-person book talk. Wow. There is not a screen in front of me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I thought first I'd ask you all, uh, and you can just say through your echoing mass, when you think about climate change in your own lifetime, what word or couple of words, not more than that, comes up as sort of a popcorn? Um, there are about 70 stories in the book, and I'm going to share with you a little bit about the theory <laughs> behind the book and then talk uh, about a couple of examples to kind of illustrate the theory for you, and that'll include hopefully a couple of readings, and then we'll, we'll chat about climate stewardship. Um, this book is very different than, for instance, the California Naturalist Handbook, which I did as a collaborative project as well or really anything I've ever written before. And that is because it is about climate change and there's a lot we know now about how to communicate about climate change. And everything we know about how to communicate about climate change. Um, and some principles that we followed were, for instance, a show not tell principle. So we're taking off of some recent, I mean, this is something that Brendan Bueller, who helped write it in a narrative form, um, says to me, he says, yeah, when you tell people what to do, it's like nails on a chalkboard, <laughs> you know? And there was a recent publication by a guy named Palm and, and their colleagues, and they basically did these experiments with folks, and they gave them uh, statements about what they should do to change their behavior to mitigate climate change. So, you know, eat less meat, travel less, do these things in your community. <laughs> Um, and they did them with the four of scientists say you should eat less meat, and then they did without scientists say it didn't matter how they presented these statements. When they did pre and post surveys of those that were exposed to these statements, inevitably the statements made people want to do less. So it's sort of that that the lesson of the of the experiment was really what we kind of all know, and anybody who's a parent knows this is like do not say do this, do that, right? Because it's like oh. Um, Narrative. Uh, why work with, you know, recruiting Brandon Bueller to work with me as a narrative writer because I'm a scientist, not a narrative writer, um, was important because it turns out that they have done studies and most people will read twice as much material if it's in a narrative than if it's not. And they actually retain twice as much information if it's narrative, right? So storytelling is the way that people learn. Um, it's not. Uh, landing well to hear about the impacts of climate change very far from our own experience, right? That might be, and that may also relate to who is the voice or who is the storyteller, right? Is this a trusted person, a trusted messenger or someone I can relate to? Can I imagine myself in this story? So we sort of had to think about who are telling all these stories and how we try to represent different voices and different communities and different experiences in different places, but they're all very place-based. 
And I'm sure that you would be able to relate to, you've probably been to many of the places um, that we talk about in the book. We also, this is the um, text, the complimentary text to climate stewards, the course, which Caitlin's going to talk about when I finished, um, right, offered here through Sonoma Ecology Center. Um, it was really important that we write this book for California. Actions are meant to be you know, both local, as we were already talking about, but also sort of tangible and actionable and things regular people can do. We kind of leaned more toward folks that were not professionals in the professional environmental sector as voices. So that was an active choice. And it's not to say that we don't, I interview some scientists, I interview some professionals to kind of capture their wisdom, but I interview a lot of people who are just volunteering in their community. Maybe they were doing something totally different and now they want to get involved in climate change. I, I, was, I had the good fortune of being in Cambridge for my sabbatical recently in 2019, and I was talking to a lot of people about climate change education, communication, and outreach. And I met some people who took a fairly popular course in England at the time about climate change. It was about more like how to reduce your uh, carbon footprint, basically. So I asked my friends who had taken this class, I how did that feel? Like, was that a great class? How did it feel? It felt terrible. Like, I, I hated going to that class. I didn't want to go every evening. You're never doing enough. And and I've had that feeling, too. I don't know if you've had this feeling, but for instance, like, I'll, I'll purchase something, and then I'll get home and get really upset that it was wrapped, like, three times. Like, I didn't, the tea bags were on sale. I didn't know they were going to be, like, triple wrapped. Like, I go off of my brain about how I did the wrong thing. I bought the tea bags that were on sale, and look at all this garbage I have. You know, and it just sort of, sort of like feels terrible. We were really trying to avoid making climate stewardship about individual actions. And that's not to say that we don't want to value people walking the talk, because we do. Like, we all kind of make some decisions to walk the talk. And other times, I can speak for myself, I'm not always walking the talk. And it doesn't actually help me that much to beat myself up. And of course, uh, the quintessential example of individual behavior versus collective action, which we try to really focus on collective action, the stories in the book and in our sort of approach to helping folks know what to do about climate change is, um, you know, some people can put solar panels on their roof and that's great, you can do that, but everyone can help with community choice aggregated energy, right? So it's all about kind of making it available for all. You know, everybody's working with others to, you know, maybe scale it up and do that kind of transformative change. Um, the other thing is that we can't, I, I think we know this, you wouldn't be here if you didn't think this a little bit, like we can't just sit around and wait for nation states to solve climate change, right? Like they haven't done it since the 80s. And COP26 is not like this revelation of action, right? So we're already on 26 conference of parties and we're still waiting around for like some major transformation. So I really believe that it's, it's going to be this sort of regional, state, regional, commu community scale, that sort of regional community meso scale. I think that at that scale, people can collectively make some really amazing changes for their communities and really exemplify what needs to be done, and that those can be rolled up as collective action. And also that those can be used to show, not tell the larger nation states and politicians, this is what we mean, what we want, right? Like we're not, you know, you may not be changing emission standards, but we're going to change emission standards, and you may not be thinking win, but we're going to show you what win looks like, right? So not to say that we don't want to foster a civic engagement. I think we do. Um, but I think it's at that community scale and when we work together that we can really make those kinds of changes. In other words, policy changes are still part of the solution set. Um, an example of that comes out of Palm Springs, where Ellen Lockhart was the founder of Climate Action Palm Springs. And the reason I want to talk to Ellen is there are now quite a few community climate action groups. There's probably one in Sonoma. But Palm Springs was actually pretty early on this kind of concept that we're just going to have a community action group and we're going to address climate change. And they did a tremendous amount of sort of community vision that then ended up pushing the city council to do things like the community choice, agriculture, aggregated 
energy program. They encouraged um, the city to prefer solar on new residential construction, and they also banned um, gasoline leaf blowers. Um, so each time they meet, it was sort of like, what are we going to take on, and how are we going to move that forward? And it's not to say they did alone, the city council, all these other groups, but there's something about just regular community folks coming together and deciding that's what they're going to get. They're going to really lobby for that and sort of do that collectively. Um, so they've been really effective down in Palm Springs. Um, can't help but mention fire. I was actually glad to be driving by fairly greened up hills on my way here. It's been a while since I've been here in a greenscape. Um, I, in the book, we actually start uh, the book. Well, Greg Sarah starts the book off with a, a wonderful um, teaching um, from Abel McKay. So it's very placed in the dream story world of his ancestry. Um, but then we sort of jump in as authors and talk a lot about, um, kind of use the Michael Gologly story from Pepperwood. So uh, you all remember the Tubbs fire that burned through across Pepperwood. Two fires have been through Pepperwood recently, but that one took um, Michael's home. And it was interesting talking to him because he's been a land steward at Pepperwood for, for his whole almost adult life, very, very long time living at Pepperwood. And he really focused on, of course, talking, I mean, of course, he talks about escaping the fire and the trauma of that. Um, but then he talks about fire as regenerative for California's ecosystems and mentioned the numbers of uh, fire chasers that came after. I think there were 14 species that they didn't see um, until that fire went through. And how uh, the volunteers kind of kicked in. And as you can, you all know, when wildfire happens, um, there's a lot of damage that can occur when all the big equipment comes in and puts the fire line and gets the roads and all of that stuff. So that all had to be attended to and of course which trees were going to come down and addressing safety issues and things like that so the pepperwood stewards kind of really kicked in after the fire and helped with all of that so you know michael was obviously devastated by this material loss and the trauma of that evening in escaping the fire he was also just incredibly invigorated by both the natural response, the ecosystem's response to the fire, as well as the community's response to the fire, which was incredibly heartening. Um, and with that, I'll read you a little bit. Um, so Pepperwood is building a new house for Michael and his family to return to on the preserve. It won't have all the wall hangings from their trips to Mexico or the family photos, but he says, fire reduces you down to your body and the planet not you and all your stuff. He continues, it does my heart good to see the preserve come back, the wildflower displays, the new species, and all the animals that are here and thriving. Following the fire, 12 previously unseen native species showed up, all known as fire followers, because they only germinate after fire. It just makes me think, how our people-made systems need to be more resilient and fire adapted, like nature is. And then we can get through these things a lot easier. I weave in quite a bit of climate science. Um, I would say uh, all focused uh, in, in context of California. So climate in context of California is weaving throughout, running throughout. Um, so an example of that is that when we're talking about what happened with the Tubbs fire, can, and maybe somebody knows this, so I don't want to presume you don't, um, you probably may see the connection between, for instance, the jet stream and our fire weather. So it kind of brings in this whole thing of like, instead of thinking about, we're going to learn about atmospheric chemistry and how there's climate forcing and da, 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 which is the way I would normally lecture about climate change. <laughs> this 
the way we work at it at the book is sort of like, okay, what happened that night? Well, what happened that night is a bunch of naturalists were at the conference all day in Pepperwood. There was really like 160 of us, thank God we didn't get trapped. We're all noticing the winds are picking up, the winds are picking up. My, Michael's saying like, it's gonna get really windy. We're like, take down the banners, all that stuff. And, um, you know, by about 8.30 at night, then, you know, we start to smell the smoke. Um, but those winds, those really, really fast winds created in generally in the fall, um, and they result in part from pressure differential when the jet stream dips down on the east side of California and creates a low to high pressure gradient very, very shortly around the jet stream. And then that pressure gradient, th those always create winds, right? So that's where you get our easterlies, our Diablo winds, or in Southern California called the Santa Ana winds. And they pick up and then, of course, pick up speed down the Sierra and pick up speed again on the coast range. Um, so some of it is our sort of topography, which we know that follows those through those canyons. Um, though the, 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 the wilier jet stream that we're seeing because of climate change, we're seeing those also those cold fronts come down through southern Texas. That's kind of the same effect when the jet stream drops. You see it on the news. Also, oh, the jet stream's way down here. Um, that's in part happening because as the poles get, as the North Pole warms, right, what keeps the jet stream behaving and staying circular and sort of rhythmically in a band is the cold of the North Pole and the warm of the mid latitudes that bounds the jet stream there. And so as those temperatures become more and more similar, especially late in the summer in the North Pole, that jet stream gets unleashed because it's not bounded between hot and cold. It's basically bounded between warm and a little warmer. <laughs> and it goes, oh. But meanwhile, there's still cold Arctic air that's coming down right through the pressure. Um, so fire, personal, um, also related to California ecosystems, also related to global forcing also related to the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, right? That's warming the poles. Um, I, I should, while we're talking about fire a little bit, talk about traditional burning. Um, indigenous people have been burning and using burning for indigenous stewardship uh, since time immemorial. And it brings a variation of species and age classes of plants and animals that were used, right, as indigenous food, as medicine, as materials for people for a long time. So we talked to Bill Tripp and other people in the book. He's a Karu tribal member who are fortunately sharing a lot of these practices of using fire um, to restore uh, California's ecosystems you know, in a way that helps us to address fuel management, in a way that helps us to um, reju rejuvenate uh, our ecosystems, protect our communities, and also honor the sovereignty and cultural practices of indigenous people. So that is, um, is something we, we look to. Those are popping up everywhere. How wonderful is that? I um, talked to someone who started one of the, the first ones of those up in Plumas, um, mm -hmm. learning from some great people like Manuel Quinn Davidson and Jeff Stackhouse. And so there's been quite a few people in Cooperative Extension who've been helping communities to start good fire associations or prescribed burn associations. Um, and I think Baby is just a really excellent example. You know, and I talked to him, so he's, he's owned his ranch for several generations in Plumas County. And uh, he burns to get rid of conifer because it's encroaching on oak woodlands and he really wants a lot of acorns and all of that. So he's very much into prescribed burn. And he was doing these on his own, which was really tricky. And then they started this, he heard about this burn alliance. He goes, we gotta start one of those, you know? So bottom line, he used to do this alone. It's a lot of work to do prescribed burn, um, really helpful for the land. But uh, now he said, oh, I've got like 120 people on my, mailing list or my email list and I just let them all know it's going to be a prescribed burn day and they all come out and bring you know food and we get it done and the burn boss has got all the volunteers we need and you know so it's great so it's just you know really 
um, thrilled to have this like community support in burning the land that he needs to get done. And so that, that was a pretty fun. Um, and his quote, I, I also thought it was funny when he said, just quote me as BB in the book because you're know those insurance companies. I and mean, that's a whole other story, right? <laughs> about prescribed burn insurance. So he, his quote was, um, we're terrified of fire, but we don't have to be. Fire can be a good friend or your worst enemy. And um, I, I t- I'll talk just a minute about drought and then food. Drought, I'll be quick. We've been through too much drought, right? <laughs> um, all right, so when we think about drought, right, we're thinking dry soils, hot temperatures, less rainfall. Um, we're expecting more atmospheric rivers, right, and less sort of We've actually had this nice kind of gentle rain this year, which has been really, really awesome. The more rain we can get like that, the better. Um, one of the ways that these changes express themselves is something we call climate water deficit, which is basically the amount of water that a plant wished it could have if it could have all the water it wanted, right? And the deficit comes in with, like, if you're growing a crop, right, you have to irrigate to make up for the missing water that the plant wishes it had. Um, in natural environments, there was an amazing study done in McLaughlin Reserve, which UC runs um, in Lake County. And Susan Harrison is one of the only people who's taken enough years of data, she took 15 years of data on the same plots. These are little herbaceous plants out in south of Clear Lake. And she did them in grazed areas and non-grazed areas. And what she found over all this time was that it was climate water deficit, it was soil moisture that was leading to the loss of some of the species in her plots over time. And it didn't matter if they were in serpentine sites or not serpentine or grazed or not grazed. It was like, I'm losing these species from these plots. And the species that she's losing are the kind that have like the fleshiest leaves, right? So that leaf area is really big. So it's just a really important study because it kind of definitively showed like there's this long-term data set and we can see that the, the water deficit problem is impacting our natural ecosystems. We all know like we're also irrigating more or irrigating earlier, all that stuff. But it was interesting to see it like shifting our native plant communities as well. Lastly, we're in Sonoma. How can we not talk about food? Um, agriculture actually contributes about 10% of the U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. So, you know, working in the agricultural sector for stewardship is very, very important. Um, we also know that organic waste leads to methane emissions, things like that. So what I was surprised is how many pounds uh, of food rots in the country's fields. It's estimated to be 58 million pounds of food rots in the country's fields. Um, and so that's kind of where these gleaners come in. Mm-hmm. And, and I interviewed this woman named Jennifer Calderon, who's a food preserver. And she started, originally she started a school garden program, but more recently she started Glean Slow for San Luis Obispo. And she started it because she was walking around the neighborhood and she sees like lemons and tomatoes, like tons of food, like all these gardeners. You know, she was a master gardener, master food preserver. She's kind of like, we all have like all this food. So she sort of got, and she said it's the easiest group for her to get volunteers for as anything else because all the gleaners go to farms and then they get food and there's free lemons or whatever. So anyway, she started this whole community program. It goes to schools and to the food bank. And um, she said, and I'll leave you at this with this quote, so much water and labor has gone into producing that fruit or vegetable. There are so many people hungry in our community it's important to nurture the health of the entire community. So she has been involved in Glean Slow and they're just doing some really fun work. Pulling. They also now work on farms. So they go both to farms and to, to gardens. I will mention Ava post coup, but I won't, I won't do a reading from her and I'll close with a different re- uh, closing reading. Um, also in food, I think we all appreciate that there are parts, uh, places in California where people are extremely food insecure. And, um, and one of those is Watts. Um, and Ava Postku is a certified California naturalist, and it was really interesting talking to her about her work for Watts Labor Community Action Committee. So she is in Watts helping urban gardens, preventing food waste, improving access to healthy food. Um, she knows a lot about soil remediation 
and goes, she does both a free farmer's market. So they're collecting food from supermarkets and things like that, that where the food's going to go off. And then she, you know, organizes bringing it to Watts for an open free farmer's market every week. She has a community garden called Mudtown Farms. And then they're doing individual gardens and they have to like, there's all the soil is contaminated and what. So they raise the beds up, they put clean soil on top. They have a planting palette that the residents can choose from. So you can choose which fruit trees you want, which these, you know, annuals you want. And their work, she works with just tons and tons of volunteers to make all of that happen. I think I'll just close with a, a short reading from the end of the book. All right. Communities are adopting novel approaches embedded within nature from ecosystem restoration to promoting regenerative economies that stay with planetary boundaries and are focused on thriving rather than infinite growth. While physically distancing, we are mobilizing for racial justice, standing up for science and calling for an end to climate disruption. Together, we can reinvent normal life to be regenerative and strengthen our interconnection with nature and interdependence with each other. Joy comes from connecting with others in a purposeful way that transcends self. Working together, we can make California resilient and experiencing lasting joy. That joy can help us give hope to the larger challenge climate change presents. Maybe the most important lesson the present catastrophe can teach us is this. We are not powerless, and we must work together to save the Earth, our only home. That's it for me. Questions? Can I have two very quick questions? Oh, yeah. First, I just wanted to say that there are folks that are gleaning in the old orchards at Jack London State Park. Great. Uh, so my two quick questions are, what part of the country do you live in? And the gentleman, D.B. in Plumas County, I'm just curious, has he had, uh, when he started doing these prescribed burns, did he have pushback from the fire department or the forest service? Yeah, so he's on private land, so his pro his biggest um, challenge is the Air Resources Control Board, which is the pollution, you know, keeps track of pollution mm -hmm. as compared to like the tribes in that area, which have huge problems with the Forest Service, right? Because they're trying to burn really on co-managed tribal lands. But uh, for BB, it's his own ranch where he was really focused, and then the prescribed burn goes around to other private ranches. Um, so his big challenges are insurance because he pays like a burn boss, he pays a professional burn boss and then community members help. Um, so he's mostly worried about insurance, maintaining his insurance and um, an air resource control board. I'm, my position's at UC Berkeley. I'm based at the Hopland Research and Extension Center, which is in Southern Mendocino County. I'm currently living a lot of time over on the coast of Mendocino County. I did a lot of research here in Sonoma Valley. It's really nice to be back. Um, I want to make sure that I mention the class because um, Caitlin's here. And so Caitlin is offering our UC Climate Stores class at the Snow Ecology Center. And I'm going to let her tell you how. Uh, so it's a course. It's not a lengthy thing, about 40 hours. You get to read the book mm -hmm. and meet with others and become a certified climate steward. And yeah. they have a few precious spots left. Did you interview anyone from Friends of the Bay? I did not, but there are a couple of Bay Area stories in there. There's one from Latino Outdoors, a really neat one about uh, um, Richardson Bay. And there's a whole long thing on Highway 37 <laughs> that is like the easiest place to see King Tide meets sea level rise, meets infrastructure, meets restoration, right? So there's quite a bit on the North Bay um, and then quite a bit on green roofs and all kinds of other sort of things in the Bay Area. Um, but I've always wanted to write a book uh, interviewing modelers. And I and now that I've worked with Brendan on a narrative interview style, and I still would need some help on that, but I'm a little further along on it now that I've interviewed so many people, because I did all the interviews, so there were like 70 interviews. So 
I would like to, I've always thought about, I do some spatially explicit forecasting models. So I model into the future of land use change and did a lot for Sonoma County back in like the 90s and the early aughts. Um, and I wanted to think about models as the kind of like the crystal ball, like pe modelers are trying to look into the future, right? And so I sort of want to talk to modelers who do different climate change models, but other models, land use change models. Some people model the economy, you know, some people. Model. I mean, I would be more on the environmental side, but, um, but for instance, people model like the changes in the distribution of yucca, right? Mm -hmm. Or, of, you know, of Joshua trees. Um, mm -hmm. And so I want to talk to the modelers, but I want to explain it to, to the layperson, like, uh, you know, how, do they, how does the model work? Why did they model it the way they model it? And what does it say about our future? Because um, I, I sometimes think that models are like a black box. So everybody goes like, the redwoods are moving to Oregon. Joshua trees are leaving the park, you know? And that's kind of the headline, right? So you're sort of, <laughs> if you're like, you're like, okay, I know the Joshua trees are like going extinct and they're not going to be in Joshua Tree National Park. They're going to be somewhere else, but sort of like, how did they get there? What, you know, generally was the process. So tell me after if you think that's a terrible idea because <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I think the things are interesting. Other people are like, what? <laughs> so hopefully before I retire, I can interview a lot of modelers. And, 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 you know, I think we've all gone through this pandemic. So I feel like we're like all um, sort of couch immunologists or whatever we are. You know, we sort of all become scientists. We know what bending the curve is now and virility. So we know all these things. And it's like, so I sort of feel like, you know, people are sort of, I hope, increasingly interested in, in science. And we can always hope. When it was like a big unknown. Mm. And some people said, no, it's not going to change. And some people said, yes, of course it's going to increase. That's mm -hmm. what happens when you increase circulation in the atmosphere. So is there any like, recent useful thing to say about, yes, winds will increase? Yes, winds will are increasing. <laughs> so they already are, right? Um, I think it's still not in a, a downscaled global circulation model for California, so it's not like we can forecast it. Mm -hmm. So that I think is very difficult. And do you remember the recent terrible tornadoes, right? Yeah, yeah. And everybody was like, "Is it climate related?" You know, and all the comments was, "That's at a resolution we can't resolve, right?" right. So it's like so that small it's wind force probably is, right? Because we are expecting things to get more violent, more strong. Um, king tides, it's related to wind too. Mm -hmm. um, so we're seeing those things. It's just the problem is that the global forcing, the scale at which we look at global forcing, and then its local impacts, there's still a disconnect between the spatial scale at which we can model the local phenomena, like the wind coming from the Sierra to the coast is way too fine a resolution for us to model it. So, so like the theory's there, but not the scenario that you can forecast it out. And nor is the attribution studies there for like, can that windstorm be attributed? Mm -hmm. uh, same with fog. Fog's a really tricky one too. Something we're starting to get a little bit better handle on like low cloud, but not so much really low sea, you know, marine layer fog is really hard to figure out what's going on or what will go on. <laughs>